Hi guys, this is gsnom.com and I'm here with a handset called the CAT S61. It's truly a special phone. It's uh, basically an almost indestructible phone, the CAT S61. Comes from Caterpillar, you know those guys who make excavators, bulldozers, boots, all sort of manly stuff and here it is. It's got the rubber, it's got the metal and it's got the grit. It costs $1,050. I know it's a lot, but it has some life-saving and business-saving tools. Air sensor, got your laser sensor here. You got the thermal imaging sensor here at the backside. So a lot of stuff happening here for a, such a robust phone with Android and mid-range specs. So this is the CAT S61, one of the few rugged phones we've tested lately. And let's talk about the design first. So it's very robust and manly. One would call it bulky, massive, solid. We actually took a tractor, yes, a tractor, and uh, ran over it. Believe it or not, we did run a tractor over it. And we actually have the video to, to prove it. And that's pretty much it. So here we go. We subjected the device to dirt, to dust, to water. We washed it. We trampled it. We put it through everything. We dropped it from the height. This is the tractor and you can see here it being dropped from a height and surviving without a problem. The best thing about this video is probably the moment when the tractor runs over it. And the phone actually survives. The CAT S61 with its robust rubber and also metal frame. And here we go. That's the actual moment when it gets run over. I know it's pretty impressive and this happened before you can see this review. There are small dents here and there and traces, but overall you wouldn't tell this has been under a moving tractor. So that's impressive. It's a 13 millimeter thick phone. It weighs 250 grams. I know it's a lot, but in the end you get an almost indestructible phone. If you're working in agriculture with oil, with engineering, steel, coal, it's waterproof up to three meters for 60 minutes. It's got IP68, it's got IP69K. We took a tractor over it, it can survive dirt, water, salt, sand, dust, uh, what else? Drops of up to 1.8 meters on concrete, vibration, temperatures of minus 25 degrees Celsius to plus 55, you name it. So, a sturdy metal frame, a rubber at the back, and that's all I had to say. Of course, some physical buttons to make underwater use better. Now, that's been the design. Let's talk about the display. 5.2 inch IPS LCD Full HD. You can use it with wet fingers and also with gloves. It has Gorilla Glass 5 protection. And now when it comes to the actual viewing experience, we have uh, our typical test video here. Let's check it out. Okay. So our typical test video is show, showing the following things. So I would say that the colors are pretty well calibrated. The brightness is rather solid. The contrast is actually not bad in one full sunlight and we got wide view angles. So overall it checks out and you'll see in a minute that it actually more than checks out when it comes to the day to day usage. Okay, so we go back here and let's actually try and find photos to get a better orientation of what's happening here. Okay, photos, albums, and here we go. So this is the pixel arrangement. It's of the RGB straps variety, and we measure the brightness, achieving a huge and very impressive 603 lux units. It's actually superb in the 12th placed phone from all the ones we've tested lately. It beats OnePlus 6, Sony Xperia XZ2, Google Pixel 2 XL, so actually not bad. Still it scores below the iPhone 10 and the Huawei P20 Pro, just in case you're wondering. The settings for the screen are rather average, typical stock ones. And now on the CPU front, where we're getting a familiar face in the Qualcomm Snapdragon 630 seen on the Zenfone 4 last year, Octa Core accompanied by 4 GB of RAM, 64 GB of storage, there's a micro SD card slot, there's no lag, we ran games, we had a blast, and the phone only becomes a bit sluggish in the core apps, the thermal imaging and things like that, but those are hardcore apps. We played Riptide, we played Merge Plane, and I have a feeling you can actually run Asphalt 9 and PUBG without a problem, the CPU is not that old. So there will be no lag except for the hardcore applications like the thermal imaging and that's about it. Okay, we're actually playing a game here 
And while we're playing, I'm also going to bore you with a bit of, let's say, stats. So we did Antutu 6. And in this benchmark, we were able to surpass the Xperia XA2 and Huawei P20 Lite, which is actually not bad in Antutu 6. And then we also scored below the HTC U11 Live, which, if I remember correctly, should have the same CPU. And we also scored below the LG V10. And this was Antutu 6, which is a bit older in the newer Antutu 7. Well, we beat the Motorola Moto X4 and also the Huawei P20 Lite, uh, as well as the Allview Soul X5. But we scored below the Nokia 6.1 and the HTC U11 Live. Okay, I'm going to exit the game and see what the other benchmarks are like now. Okay, so we go here, we got your screenshots, and boy, there's a lot of them. But I'm going to stop over the famous, world famous, Geekbench 4, provided that I can actually find it. Here we go. So in Geekbench 4, in the multi-core subtest, we managed to beat the Sony Xperia XA2 and also the LG G6, scored below the Xiaomi Mi A2 and the Asus Zenfone 5. Of course, there's also the slingshot test, just to put it uh, shortly. In that one, we beat the Huawei Honor 8 and the Galaxy A8 2018, so graphics also check out. Basically, we beat the Xperia XA2 and Huawei P20 Lite in the core benchmarks, and it's actually not a bad result. When it comes to temperature, 36.6 degrees Celsius in Ripta GP Renegade, so no overheating, and the other test, GFX Bench, a mere 34 degrees Celsius, so once again no overheating. Of course, such a buffed phone should have a buffed battery, 4500 mAh lithium-ion, quick charge 4.0, uh, it's supposed to offer 35 hours of talk time, and I'll leave the talking to the continuous video playback test, and let's see where that one is. Okay, so as usual, we did a PC mark test and a continuous usage one. And the continuous usage one had us at 13 hours and 55 minutes. Keep in mind, we're talking here about video playback in a loop. So basically Netflix, YouTube, whatever, 13 hours, 55 minutes. It's better than the Galaxy Note 8, Huawei Mate 10 Pro and Google Pixel 2 XL. Scores below the Sony Xperia XA2 and the Pocophone F1. You know, the famous one from Xiaomi. Now, in the continuous PC mark usage, a very impressive result, 14 hours, 17 minutes is the sixth place phone of all time, even beating many battery phones. It beats Galaxy A3 2017, Huawei P20 Pro and Galaxy Note 9, scores below the Asus Zenfone Max, the Zenfone Max Pro M1, which we're testing, and that's about it. The charging is actually, to be honest, kind of reasonable for these durations. 2 hours and 10 minutes. And the most surprising part is that in one hour you get to 79%, which is kind of mind-blowing for me. It feels like a phone that would be remembered in the top 10 of batteries for the next year or two. This has been the battery. Let's talk about acoustics. Things are pretty simple. You get a singular speaker at the bottom and you cannot cover it in landscape, that's for sure. It's left intact. And we go here to play music where you will get your usual equalizer the Snapdragon Audio Plus with custom channels, genre settings, bass boost, around sound and so forth. But I'm going to want to listen to some tunes while we're mining in the field. Okay, so while this doesn't sound very loud, I would say the volume is okay, it could be louder, but we have a mid-level bass, there's no vibration, the voice is okay, and I have to admit that the ringtone and alarms are deafening compared to the music. We don't have bundled headphones, but we do have FM radio on this device, and once again I'm going to resort to photos to show you what we have achieved with our decibel meter test. So, 82.2 decibels achieved with a typical acoustic sample at the front and the back of the phone, it's a pretty good result, uh, it beats the Huawei P20 Lite and the Galaxy S9 Plus, scores below the Huawei Mate 10 Lite and the Motorola Moto E4. At the same time, when we're gaming or doing other things, uh, Riptide, GP Renegade, 98 decibels. It's pretty solid, beats Xiaomi Mi 6, HTC U11 and Galaxy Note 9, again. Scores below the Pocophone F1 and the HTC U12 Plus. Now, of course, such a rugged and buffed phone wouldn't have much to say about the camera, but there are actually some surprises here. So, first of all, we got the main camera, 16 megapixel shooter, dual tone flash, autofocus, PDAF, 
And that's about it. That's the 16 megapixel shooter at the back. At the front, we got a 8 megapixel shooter, uh, which is able to do only fixed focus and it's going to serve for the selfies on this uh, handset. Other than that, well, the interface is pretty straightforward, actually kind of minimalistic. What impressed me the most was a special option for underwater capture. You can see it here. And of course, you're going to have to use the physical button for that since you are underwater and all. Now we also have a gallery. We kept our expectations tempered because it's more of a work phone rather than a fun phone. But still, some surprises appeared. So let's go to the shots, see the ones taken during the day and during the night and see what happened there. Okay, so I'm going to start with the daytime shots. I have to say that uh, the color calibration was pretty okay at first, even though the HDR kind of spoils the fun sometimes and makes the image feel a bit too white. Okay, so aside from the whole thing about the HDR making things too white, every once in a while there was a blurred shot, so we don't have exactly a very constant camera. And this is what happened on HDR. I know this is a bit dark, but when you try to light it up, it's actually too white and too washed out, so keep the HDR action at a minimum. These are the other shots we've taken. I would say that the colors are decent, or even though they're a bit colder for my taste and coming off some Samsung and some iPhones. And to be honest, the selfies are actually kind of good. Talking about the texture of the skin, you can see every scar, every pore, the eyes and also the light helped a lot. So for a fixed focus and megapixel camera, the selfies were actually above expectations. Now we go here for several more shots. I would have to say they're decent, but don't get up in the options with your HDRs, you'll be disappointed. We got some excellent close-ups and not bad colors, but if the sun is strong, you may find yourself with some messed up dynamic ranges and some overexposed vegetation. This is the panorama, uh, pretty lit up by the sun, but I've seen worse, more close-ups actually excellent ones, more selfies, overall good clarity in spite of the fact that at about every 10 photos there should be a blurred one. So really take your patience and your time and focus properly, you'll be happy with the results. I would put this at the level of a Nokia 6.1, maybe a Moto G6 or maybe a Samsung Galaxy A6 2018. It's good in the focus, the close-ups, the colors, even though when the sun gets too strong you may find yourself with some overexposure. And the selfies were probably the best surprise here. Rest assured, you'll see more shots in the full text review. These are daytime captures and the surprise came in the low light captures. I was not expecting this. So things look very, very bright. Somehow I think they're aided by the other special sensors. Even the flash shot was good. It's not too white. It's not blue. It doesn't have any aberrations or artifacts. It's actually pretty okay, surprisingly. As you can see here, it doesn't exaggerate in any way, so that's pretty okay. Okay, things are bright, the zoom may not be the best in the world. Uh, nice color calibration, a decent level of yellow hue caused by these lights, which I know that have some lines coming from the source of the light, but I've seen worse. And overall the street light halos are quite good, so look at the clarity and look at the colors plus the brightness. I am very impressed. I would put this in a top 5 mid-range phones of 2018 or even ever and I was definitely not expecting this. I would say it beats a Huawei P9 Lite and P10 Lite, also even a P20 Lite. It may gravitate in the area of a Zenfone 5 maybe or phones like the Moto X4. So this has been the photo section. Now we go to the video section and we got it covered here. So we go back, got a camera and you can shoot 4K. That's the first thing I have to mention. You can shoot 4K videos. Not the worst electronic stabilization in the world. No weird flicker, no refocus, but a lot of overexposure, a lot. And generally, while this was rather okay, in general, things were a bit shaky. I'm talking about the average video. And when the sun is strong, you'll find yourself with some overexposure for sure. Actually, not a bad zoom but the greens are exaggerated, they feel like they're phosphorescent and the microphone is a bit echoey and cannot face the wind too well. More shots, we're actually lucky enough to have a lot of color. You can see here the trembling of the image, the shakiness, even though when I was walking, not that bad. Overall, rather mediocre, it's in the range of a Samsung Galaxy J, 
but we do have a 4K video or two that looks well, decent. The reds become pink, the green has been deformed, so in the end, just a low mid ranger performance from the video department. And the wind cannot handle the, uh, the microphone cannot handle the wind. So, at the level of a Galaxy J5 2017, or maybe a Motorola Moto G5S, or maybe slightly above it. Now, in low light conditions, things are, I would say, mid level, mediocre, long halos, a bit of refocus, some grain. The colors are decent, brightness is what we expected, and this is on par with the Huawei P9 Lite, maybe. There's some pink and purple at the sides of the image, and the zoom is not the best in the world. And here there are actually some lines that remind me of the Zenfone 4. So overall it's exactly what we expected from a mid-ranger in the day, in the video, but it surpasses its condition in selfies and in low light uh, photo captures. We did some browsing, let's talk about other things now. We got the web browser here, it's Chrome, and let's load up gsnl.com. As you can see, not the fastest browser in the world confirmed by the benchmarks. Input is done with the stock keyboard, which also knows swipe. And now we're covering connectivity. Now the phone comes in two versions, single SIM or dual SIM. It's got uh, the USB Type-C port here covered with a lid. It's got the audio jack here covered with a lid. It's got SIM slots, micro SD card slot. It's got 4G LTE, Wi-Fi A, B, G, N, A, C. It's got NFC, Bluetooth 5.0, USB OTG. And uh, check this out, it actually has more GPS coverage than usual. It's got the coverage of GPS, GLONASS, Beidou, Galileo, uh, QZSS and SPAS, uh, which are uh, alternative satellites for your global positioning. Now, as far as the calls are concerned, they were loud and clear. I have zero objections about that aspect. And we also did a speed test or two on 4G and Wi-Fi. And let's see how that panned out. So I guess I'm going to have to, well, uh, uh, let's first remove this thingy from here. Every once in a while, a cat hair will get crazy. Okay, so we go to photos and see what happened in the speed test. Here we are with, to be honest, excellent results. On 4G, 116 mega per second downloads and it uploads 63.5 mega per second. I'm guessing this is a Vodafone or Orange, that's the carrier. And that's 4G. On Wi-Fi, impressive 226 mega per second downloads, 24.7 mega per second uploads. Great, that's the word you're looking for. And now we're off to the software and the other good things. I'm talking about the special laser ruler, the FLIR sensor, but first let's talk about the software. So this is Android Oreo 8.1 with the promise of Android Pie as soon as possible. We've got the Google feed and we've got the multitasking either with a carousel or you can use the split screen as I just did split the screen in two. We got the widgets, which are of course stock, clean Android vanilla affair. We swipe down to reveal the notifications and your quick settings. So far, so good. There's no fingerprint scanner. That is rather interesting. But I found something interesting here. Either I have missed it from other phones or it's actually not available on other phones. So uh, it's got the auto wipe feature. If you do several attempts at authentifying yourself, it auto wipes the phone. Well, other than that, we have a programmable key. I'm guessing it's this one here. It can be set to other tasks. And it's got 33 pre-installed apps. And now let's get to the nitty gritty. So we got air. We got a special air sensor here on this side. It can measure the temperature, the humidity. It shows you the time of day and it shows you a graph. So it shows you when uh, there are pollutants in the air, when there are solvents, if you're working with paint, if you're working in coal mines, or dangerous areas with fertilizers. This can actually save lives and you get to know how polluted your area is. So you can see the humidity, temperature, and if there are solvents or ammonia in the air and things like that. That's app number one, air. And then we have uh, the app toolbox, which is basically a collection of apps from other stores. You've got fishing apps, you've got ways, you've got farming apps, newest apps, running apps. So things for outdoor and even cat apps from Caterpillar. Okay, then you can also measure stuff uh, from 0 to 8 meters. You first have to calibrate it, I already did. You can see here this dot. Uh, it starts from here, from a laser sensor, and you can measure up stuff. It can show me the distance towards this table here in centimeters. It's going to appear, and it's actually going to be held like this. It's 14.9 centimeters, and you can actually uh, draw a pattern or do some more complex calculations of an area 
uh, if you want to measure it from above. And that's the laser ruler. And probably the best feature here is obviously, obviously the FLIR camera. The thermal imaging camera can take photos, videos, time lapse. You can do live streaming on YouTube. It's got the thermal map of everything. And this is it. This is my hand versus this table moving in real time with hotter or cooler areas. It shows temperature here, the average, or it can show the uh, spot of a temperature. We can select an area to view certain zones of temperature and you can actually see uh, something called the hottest point. So the hottest point here, that's it. Only some areas are the hottest. There's also a sort of night vision feature there's the iron, which is the basic one, shows the average temperature. And there's more things you can see. You can see the leaks from a pipe. You can see if a building is not properly isolated heat-wise. Uh, you can see a dot that concentrates all the heat. See heat sources up to 400 degrees Celsius, even in the full darkness. Um, what else? You can measure temperature up to 15 meters. And you can uh, pick up heat up to 30 meters. You can see the heat loss from buildings overheating of a fuse and everything in HD details and we actually have a lot of samples for you including uh, my face which is here people in the park this is taken at night and as you can see nothing seen here at night buildings so regular shot and thermal imaging shot and more situation where this comes handy in order to give you what you need as I told you before, when the core features are being used, some sluggishness may appear. And if you look at the car tires, you'll see that the tires are much hotter than the rest of the vehicle, which is basically something basic. So that's what the thermal imaging is for. It has a lot of applications and once again can save lives, I think. This has been the review and presentation of the CAT S61 from Caterpillar. It's time for the verdict. Let me start with the pros. So, it's got great low light samples from the camera. It's very robust, incredibly robust. The battery beats all expectations. It's got a very, very bright screen. Okay performance. The FLIR and laser ruler are excellent to have. It's got okay acoustics, great selfies and a pretty clean OS. On the con side, it's not a phone for everyone. The camera is overall not very impressive during the daytime. The speaker could be louder. You're going to need some tutorials to get to the interesting features. Electronic stabilization, not that good. It's a pretty massive phone. It's a bit sluggish in the special features and the special apps, and that's about it. This is the bad boy of phones. You can drop it on concrete. You can run it over with your car. You can scan pipes with 400 degrees liquid. You can basically scan lava with it, but actually don't get too close to lava. It's for engineers, uh, oil experts, steel mill people, forest people, architects, agricultures, mechanics, you know, the manly of the manliest. So it's got a great battery. Uh, if you just want a phone and not the manly aspects, you're getting a battery phone with good low light capture, a bright screen, and would get, which can take a beating. This is the CAT S61. I know it's pricey at $1,050, but basically your company should buy it if you're working on cutting a forest or drilling with something hardcore in a mine. So this has been the presentation of the Catex 61 from gsnl.com. Bye-bye.